Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg and I'm very excited to, uh, to talk to our guest today, Ronald Wimberly. Some of the highlights uh, from his publishing career is comic side of things, Sentences, The Life of M.F. Grimm, uh, Prince of Cats, She-Hulk, Lighten Up, um, Black History in Its Own Words, two issues of the Oversized Lab Magazine published by Beehive Books. And I make mention of Beehive Books because your upcoming uh, Kickstarter is going to be published by Beehive Books, Grattanin. Uh, we're going to be bouncing all over the place today, Ron, but uh, man, I'm excited to sit down and talk talk comic shops with you. How you doing? Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. Um, oh, thanks for having me, man. I'm really, I'm really excited, really happy, man. I'm, I'm good. It feels like today may be uh, a whisper of spring in New York, you know, in Brooklyn here. So I'm feeling great. You know, I got my uh, bacon, egg and cheese on a roll and my coffee. So I'm, I'm ready to talk now, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. We've had, uh, you know, I'm in Pittsburgh and it's the same deal. Like winters are long and gray and we had our little blast of spring this weekend. It's raining today now, but uh, your space <laughs> looks well lit. That's a nice, uh, yeah. makes an artist yeah. envious. Oh, oh yeah. Well, you know what? Like that makes me thankful because today the weather is nice, but the sun isn't that great in here, particularly today. Some days it's like, I have a little a reading spot on my couch. I, I've been bad with my time management lately, so I haven't had a chance to sit there and read, but like there's a nice little, the sun comes in in the morning and I can go there and like sit down. Yeah, I am blessed. I am blessed. Thanks Good. for helping me remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Good place to start. Um, so Grattanin, let's, mm. uh, let's begin with this new project. Um, mm. You know, I've seen a little bit of information on it and it sounds fascinating. You, do you want to describe that for everybody? Yeah, sure. Um, Grattanin is, uh, it started out as a web comic on Stila. Um, actually, Grattanin is a little bit older than that. I guess we could get into that too. Uh, the latest iteration started out as a web comic I made for Stila. Um, I got it back, then I put it out on Webtoon. Um, it was designed originally for was designed for the Infinite Scroll. I don't know. I, maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse. I'm getting into the form of it, <laughs> but like it's about it's about ninjas. It's about a young group of ninjas that are uh, part of a. a a group, um, a, a family that um, in order for them to maintain their space in Brooklyn, they uh, recruit three new young ninja because they're about to get moved off their land by eminent domain. So in order to in order to stay there, they recruit three new recruits so that the ninja union, there's a ninja union, um, fights on their behalf, you know, to, to keep them in their historical home in Gowanus, Brooklyn. We pick up with these three ninja um, going against the um, the guidance of their their teachers to uh, fight crime in the street, um, and they find uh, they find that it's a little more complicated than that. So it's, it's a little bit of a um, it's a bit of a uh, it's like Naruto, like a a socially um, aware Naruto. I guess Naruto is also about restorative justice. Both Naruto and my comic are about restorative justice. Don't at me. <laughs> Man, that's that's awesome. Um, so you're going to do a print edition. So translating yeah. this from, like, I think of them as phone comics, you know, mm -hmm. I, I screen comics, digital comics, web comics, a lot of words here. That's probably the best way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, Webtoons, you mentioned migrating it to Webtoons. And I mean, clearly, that's an app for reading comics on the phone screen, which I think mm -hmm. is a little bit different. And uh, the adaptation from phone screen to print, yeah. this seems like a challenge and yeah. I can't wait to see what you're doing with this. You know, like from the very beginning, I was working on that, I was in Angoulême, right? I think the first issue when I first started on it. And I had a bit of a format change in how I was working. So like I had a big light table at, at Angoulême. It changed the way I work, you know, comics. Um, and I was thinking, well, I'll draw these like traditional pages, then I'll break them out of that and then put them into the, the screen format um, and maybe adjust things a little bit. I did that for one issue, right? For like <laughs> one sequence. Then I was like, no, I have to work in that mode. So the first issue kind of was, written and drawn as a comic, you know, like a, a, a bound comic. Then from there, I started to think about the screen in the production. And for that reason, uh, when we came to the, when we decided to print, I was like, well, 
we it the printing needs to reflect at least somewhat um the original format you know meaning like the verticality of it you know um originally i thought and i'd even done tests where uh maybe i'll make a a subway map because it's new york so like the subway is like the uh, circulatory system of the city you know um and we we didn't stick with that. Josh was like, well, maybe we'll do a scroll, like a literal ninja scroll. I was like, okay, that sounds pretty fucking cool too. Uh, Good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we we landed on doing a, um, we had Chloe Chef come on, like who's our uh, design partner on Lab. Like the actually the third issue of Lab um, is uh, Chloe and Natalie, my, my partners um, helped with that. And Chloe from that project, um, is working on this Scratton in book and like yeah we decided to go with this uh accordion style um presentation and it's like it's almost you get maybe four screens at a time and then you can flip you can get the entire thing if you if you're ambitious <laughs> 400 <laughs> feet of comics right. I read. <laughs> yeah 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 you could do that um I, and there has know, to be some some stunt promo of that stuff like that's bigger than a football <laughs> field you know yeah. what I mean? Like lay yeah. that thing out goalpost to, or, or beyond oh. goalpost to goalpost. Oh man. The, yeah. Uh, we're gonna, it, it's going to be a group. It would be a group endeavor because to hold that down, all it takes is one gust to win. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, that accordion format, you don't see it a lot. Um, I, I have a book, uh, I think it's Elvis road had done one in the early two thousands mm. and, uh, it, but it's it's nowhere near 400 feet. You know, it's probably 20 something. I think Joe Sacco did one it, it, uh, within the last 10 or 15 years, probably with D&Q or Fanographics, but it's not something you see that often. But on the scale of 400 feet, like I'm surprised well, that's a little bit surprised that's even possible or feasible. That's kind of amazing sound. Well, well, Jim, okay, Josh, Josh presents it in a, in, in a, in a way that is maybe a bit misleading because there are, there are at least eight episodes, right? So it's broken up. You know what I mean? Like it's not 800 continue, you okay. know, like it's not, you know, four, yeah, four, no, no, no. That's ridiculous. Like, um, I, one of my, uh, design problems to solve or like one of the ethics that I have is I want things to be readable easily, you know, like, um, there are a lot of comics that are kind of cool and format um, that I don't even read very much. You know, like I think one of the things about the, so if I'm translating a webtoon to uh, print, then I feel like one of the things that's unique about the webtoon format is the ease of reading it, right? So um, maybe even more in some ways competitive with a paper comic, right? The difference is a paper comic um, I think embodies a type of spatial time movement that, you know, it's, I've yet to see a web comic do. It's like when you can pick up a paper comic and you can look at the first and the last page of the comic at, at the same time, <laughs> you know, like flipping through a comic is like, that's unique to a book, right? Um, and this has that, uh, uh, but also I, I needed for it to be, I didn't want it to be too unwieldy as to, you know, to sum it up. So, yeah, I yeah, thought of yeah. your uh, your map description, and yeah. you know, like you always see people with atlases and they can't fold them back up right. And right, you know, if this right. were one continuous piece, right, I, I can imagine it being in piles, uh, you know, next to people's beds or coffee tables. Yeah, no, that's the one thing I. That's what I don't want. As much as Beehive is great at making beautiful objects, like that you can read, I wanted something that. Um, was kind of more seductive like it, it invited you to read like one of the things i love about comics that i think you know as the you know as the prospectors changed the market as like people started to collect and you know it changed a bit was like yeah no you get a comic there's so many of them they're made on pulp you know like they're you know roll it up put it in your back pocket you get it in a little bubble gum you know like they're everywhere you know like that's what i love about comics like i love that that accessibility. And so while this is a beautiful object in and of itself, um, it is also approachable. Like it was just very important to me for a comic to be approachable. Like I used to go into, um, I would go into uh, Forbidden Planet uh, in New York City. And sometimes I would go in and get a comic book 
And then when they would ask me to bag and board it, I'd say, no, I'm okay. And then I would roll it up and put it in my back pocket. Just like, <laughs> just to fuck with them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, that's my approach. Gratinin is maybe difficult to roll up and put in your back pocket, but like, you know, I mean, I hope people read it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a pretty exciting experiment. Like, I love that formal, you know, the design objects, the beautiful objects, as you say, with these different books. And uh, I'm excited for that part of it. But it's also interesting, like I saw um, you were in Columbus, you had an exhibition with some of those early Grattanen pages. Mm -hmm. And you had like the vertical, you know, what you're describing whenever you transition to drawing it basically for the screen. And mm -hmm. I can remember seeing those columns, you know, like, like several columns on a page. And it's interesting to think of like, how does that translate into a book? Like mm -hmm. I find books are even a weird technology at this point, because I have students who make comics and it's almost all on screen, but then they'll, they'll format them where they're like pages in a spread. But mm -hmm. if you're reading it on screen on an iPad or something, it's this weird thing where it's like read half the page and then go up and read the other half of the page because yeah. it's, it's not a book. It's not bound. Right. Why do we have a, you know, why do we have this weird divide? But if you adapt, you know, almost the way you drew your originals, you could mm -hmm. almost imagine like several columns across mm -hmm. like a traditional page spread because mm -hmm. why not you know like mm -hmm. the page is already a strange format in today's world right. yeah yeah i mean well so that was a you know man jim like uh for me format is like i don't know it's the most it's one of the most important things in how i think about like maybe even when i'm writing a story like format shapes story for me, you know, like pacing, uh, you know, um, my approach to the story. So like, I think um, one, I was naive at the very beginning of drawing Grattanen. Um, and we could get into this. Grattanen has always been kind of like a way for me to explore the form of comics because um, originally, yeah, so to go back a little bit, um, I don't know which way I want to do it. Let me finish the first thought. <laughs> so when I approached the um, the comic and drew them as pages, I uh, I started to realize shortly after a while that my thinking, um, doing it on the in the page way and then translating it to the screen was kind of uh, it was a step in between that was kind of like maybe working against the the way of thinking that the infinite scroll, the way I needed to think about that. And once I started to think about uh, how to translate directly my practice, which is on paper, you know, I'm not working native to the screen either. It's not like I'm drawing on a little screen, like probably that would be the best way to draw infinite scroll comics, right? Is if you had a giant kind of iPhone shaped thing and you just drew on it, right? <laughs> you know, um, but I had to do the next best thing and like also thinking about materials and not being wasteful. Uh, I eventually got to that um, setup that you saw in the museum. By the way, there was an in-between step too when I was just drawing on loose leaf sheets of paper and then putting them together um, digitally, you know? Uh, but eventually I got to that very, <laughs> you know, I kind of evolved into that. And um, I think if I were to present the way I'm working, is also, I'm not working like uh, spatially laterally, you know, probably to keep my hands clean and to keep everything together. I'm also working like this. So I think my practice started to kind of, I don't know, uh, reflect what the final uh, way of viewing the comic was. Um, and also something that I feel if you're a comic book artist, you can't forget um, uh, working on paper in that way and kind of like seeing it finished like that was also pleasurable for me, you know, because, like, you know, it's a continuum of pleasure, right? Like, it has to be pleasurable for me. I refuse to make it unpleasurable <laughs> for me to do the work, right? Like, so while it can be difficult, drawing can be um, demoralizing <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> like, uh, I made something, I made it so that there's, there were, there's pleasure all the way through to the end, you know? Man, I have a lot to, uh, a lot to unpack there. Uh, the first, the first thing I'll add is 
I always think like whatever format you're working in, like if you're doing a daily strip, if you're doing comic books, we just talked at Brubaker and he was talking about writing graphic novels, you know, like switching from comic books to graphic novels and how there were adjustments there. But I feel like whatever it is you do, you end up starting to like filter, I don't know, thought processes or experiences or, you know, kind of break down ideas in that format. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm attracted to doing phone comics for that reason. It's another format like, like you formats, very valuable to me. It's almost always worked out for me before I actually start on page one. Um, you know, sometimes even like contract stage, you know, you're fit, you're determining format. So I do think it affects the thinking part. Um, you know, and it sounds like you're describing that as you went along, uh, you know, really starting to think of the comic in that format. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, I don't know. I, I like, if you were to say, Hey, Ronald, make a story. Um, I'm almost like format is a format is liberating because I'm like, well, okay. How long? Like, okay. If it's eight pages, um, how, yeah. Like what's the size of the page? Like, what can I fit on that page? Like, you know, when you start to tell me those things, it's going to shape the story. Like, you know, um, a project that I, probably can't talk about yet but like that I'm working on uh I was given yeah like an eight page format I started to look back at the old Mattel Halan right and you know um I happened to have an issue with uh Mobius talking about uh his practice and like kind of his approach to a particular set of comics he did and like he broke down just how he was it's a simple gag you know what I mean like you lead one way then you go with the opposite, like the ending is a surprise, right? <laughs> like it's an unexpected thing. And I'm like, wow, yeah, that's that gives you enough. You have like two pages for the setup, another two pages maybe to continue like a, um, you know, uh, the, the rhythm. Then like a third, it's like, oh, this is okay. We're coming to the resolution. Then the last two pages is like, it's not what you even thought. You know what I mean? Like, so it, that's how I, I have a creative side. They're both creative. One is more like a puzzle and the other is more like, oh, well, yeah, what are the characters wearing? Or like, what's the world, this, that, and the third. I think in order to kind of funnel that second one into something that's in the shape of of something that can be seen, like externalized, my imagination externalized, format is super, I, I don't know. From, I think containers are very important. I think all of these things are very important, so. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking about sake, like the quality of sake, right? Like um, how the difference between like sake and like a pint, you know, it's like you have two different things that you're going for. And I think probably pints aren't necessarily always chilled, right? So you can get a pint and like it, it's, it can be big because you don't really have to worry about things. It's not going to go flat. You're going to drink it before it goes flat. It's not going to get super warm, you know, like um, you're supposed to finish it rather quickly, right? And and often not much below room temperature. We're like, you know, sake is served warm or, or it can be served cold as well. And so much of the, the point of drinking it is ritual around like who's serving whom, like, you know, um, and it's conversational. And, you know, like, so I'm thinking about how these different ways of drinking sometimes it shapes the container shape or reflect the way that you're going about it. You're like a pint, you're walking around like uh, the room maybe, or you're at the, the bar, like wherever you're at. And it's like, you get your bit, the bartender's serving up everyone. You know what I mean? Like, I think comics is similar to that. Like food containers all around our, our, our lives reflect, I think, the function of whatever it is. So and I think comics are no different. Yeah, I, I, had a, uh, I had a design teacher and I think he stole this from Milton Glaser, I think. But he would come in and he'd put a piece of paper on the on the board, you know, with whatever problem we had. And he was always like, what are you going to put on it? What are you going to put in it? You know, it was like that was defined really as like step zero. Like before we'd even know what we were facing, it was like, here's what you have to work with. It's a canvas, you know, if you're if you're a painter or whatever. But uh, you always have that at some point in the process. And the sooner it's developed, the more it can affect your story development and all of those things. Yeah, like think about man think about um andy wyatt right like you said it's a canvas right yeah are you working on canvas are you working on paper are you using you know oil paint are you using you know andy used the tempera right a a lot right 
look at how it changed the shape of the work you know like it 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 literally becomes the what you know his work for the style the mark making you know i think it's it it's it's a lot it's like when people i remember or you see this often when people are like this artist is like that artist right and it's like well they're using some of the same tools right and that's what you feel people are kind of connected to it's like maybe they're using some of the same tools in the same way um yeah you gotta i i don't know constraint is very important and gratinin started out as a way for me to a constraint in and of itself i just seen arzak i was in college and it was my second comic really was a gratinin comic um my first comic was called um vandal vigilantes right and it was kind of really inspired by uh slow jams uh chose slow jams right and it was a bunch of talking it was really rough you know what i mean <laughs> like you know um and so then my second comic even though that one was a to be continued i just completely changed <laughs> changed up i you know i was reading arzak and i was like i just want to focus on visual storytelling you know um i don't want any talking and i want lots of action i was like what do you think what is what is a lot of action and silent right <laughs> so <laughs> ninjas right <laughs> but it's gratuitous you know like it's like, you know, um, the idea was, I'm just putting ninjas in here for the sake of putting ninjas in here, one. And two, ninja have always been interesting to me, particularly in the context of like knights or anything. It's like, there's no reason really for them. Like after the light bulb, right? Like ninjas, as we know it, like the, the light bulb killed the ninja, right? Like, so there's no point, right? Or like, there's no point for these ninja to do the things that they were doing even, right? Like, so it became existentially interesting to me as well uh, to think of a contemporary story where ninjas were. At first it was kind of high fantasy, but then, you know, slowly that built into it. Man, that's funny to think of ninjas as like the answer to, I, I just am interested in action. I'm, yeah. I don't want to do it talking. And they're quiet. Yeah, yeah it's perfect. Um, man, that's cool. You say that that was your second comic. Is that the mm. one that ended up at Dark Horse? Like, uh, no. Okay. No, that came. That was my Dark Horse. I think that may have been. I think that was my first printed comic, but that was my um, maybe my that that first run of Gratin in I did for the Static Fish was maybe four comics. Like it was episodic. Static Fish came out a bunch of times. Um, that was like maybe the first, that, that's the first Grattan in story. The Dark Horse comic is the second Grattan in story. Um, yeah, it's called Tangerine and it's about rooftop gardens, which is crazy. I don't know how many people, it wasn't a trend yet, right? <laughs> but like, um, I, I kind of, not to my knowledge. Yeah, um, it, it's about Ninja who, also silent, it's about Ninja who, um, re reappropriate or um they they liberate seeds from manhattan and bring them back to brooklyn like they they break into a sort of big corporate place that seems to have all of these seeds there and they bring them back and they grow it on the rooftop in in brooklyn and that seems um, ahead of its time too <laughs> yeah yeah i think that was like oh oh two or so yeah um yeah and that was for dark horse Dark Horse at the time had a webcomic uh, contest called Strip Search. And um, they did a competition every month. And if you won, they, they would, I don't know, I guess they'd collect it all at the end of the year and they bound it. They only did it once. And like, yeah, that was kind of my, uh, I'm not sure that was before the, that was my writing debut in comics, but um, around the same year, I did an issue of Matar Halan. I did like a short in it called, um, I think, Overdose. I can't, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the writer. Maybe, I don't know if you can put a Chiron on or something like later, but I don't remember the name of the writer. But I mean, the story was great. I feel like it was my, it was maybe one of the best stories I ever drew <laughs> that someone wrote for me. And it was my first one, right? 
<laughs> it's kind of like almost, you know, no offense to my other friends, but it was like almost kind of downhill. From, from wow. <laughs> You're like a savant hit the ground running. Were you always planning to do comics? Was that, was that the plan whenever you were going to school? I didn't really have a good plan for art because I didn't have anyone around me who was doing it. So like, I didn't, I, I didn't, um, I hadn't planned to do comics. Um, I didn't even know, I didn't know how it worked. Um, I would probably say that um, reading THB, like um, I had I had comics before, but like when I got to Pratt, maybe around sophomore, uh, junior year, I don't know when his giant size THB came out, but I picked it up in um, um, Jim Hanley's. It used to be uh, in Mid uh, Midtown. Um, not Midtown, but like the 30s. It used to be like right under uh, the Empire State Building. Um, so I uh, I picked it up and there was this one THB with Paul in it and he's like drawing on the floor or something. Like he's li just looking really cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, oh, okay. So this is maybe a, a pathway to art. You know, it's like I've seen other fine artists like doing a similar type of thing. And you're like, wow. This is the life, you know, like they're in their studio making, you know, like that Cy Twombly, you know, sitting there with like his work up. You're like, okay, I could do that, right? Um, and seeing Paul, I was like, oh, okay, it's like being a comic book artist is like being a rock star. <laughs> not, not though, right? I mean, for not for nothing, maybe for me, kind of, right? But like, not for everybody. It's not the, it's not really, right? Um, and so I was kind of taken with that, maybe as a junior it became that spectacle, which is kind of like a deceitful spectacle. Um, I, I, I thought, okay, yeah, I'll do comics. I was in school for illustration. I was never really excited about doing illustration professionally, like, um, and not, it was kind of the twilight of illustration really, or at least a certain type of illustration, like the late nineties, early 2000s. Um, magazines were kind of going under, um, <laughs> What my assignments at Pratt were awful. It's like, oh, let's do this assignment on make a cartoon about Monica Lewinsky. And like, you know, everybody's coming in with like cigars and like rude humor. And I'm like, is this like the pinnacle? Like, is this what I'm, is this what I'm going to do? It's like, I have no interest in doing this, right? Um, I started out in art direction. So I was like, you know, I was like, oh, I don't want to do advertising. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, let me go into illustration. And I was like, oh, I'm going to end up doing like these really kind of boring, <laughs> you know, like the most basic solutions. I want to tell stories. So and then comics was just like, and THB was just like, and I was like, okay, fuck it. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be a cartoonist. I'll make my money doing that. Did you grow up reading comics? Um, I, I grew up reading my friend's comics. <laughs> like uh, uh, a buddy of mine, John David Carlin, who's an architect now he put me on to comics and like his mom would take us to the comic book store or whatever. And I was really big into anime. So that's when I started to get into manga. You know, like I, I went to the comic book store and it's like, oh, should they have, they have, oh, they have like, um, they have like Tank Police or whatever. It's like, they have the manga here for that. It's like, so I started Appleseed. So I started to pick that up. And that's when I picked up Domu and like Domu was like, right. Grendel was really big for me. Like Grendel, it's like, I didn't really like any of, the, the only Batman comic that I really liked was uh, um, the Frank Miller Dark Knight comic. But then when I saw Grendel, you know, versus Batman, I was like, okay, this is my speed. This shit is dope. Like, it's kind of sexy. It's kind of, and who's this Grendel guy? Like, I like him more than Batman. <laughs> you, know <what> <laughs> you know, like, so um, I, I had I had moments here and there. And then like, maybe in, when I was a senior in high school or maybe junior, I got started to get the non-books like the Jordan Crane joints and like yeah I was like okay I like this is weird I don't like everything in this but like it's everything is unique and like that in and of itself is nice like there was the girl on the cover with the tv there or whatever I was like this is cute you know it's kind of funky it's got like almost kind of street it's got a street quality you know like it's got it's got this sort of ineffable quality of comics that's like intimate because it's just like one person's vision or something and like I think that stuck out to me while I was engaged in the superhero stuff because 
I love the Capcom games. Like, I love the Konami joints. Like, I had the Spider-Man pajamas. Like, I love Spider-Man as a character. I think as comics, a whole different type of comic is what, you know, like, I almost, almost didn't experience those as comics first. You know, like, I experienced them as, like, IPs and brands. Right. Yeah, I kind of have that experience. Because uh, now that I'm doing this Hulk book, I get asked about Hulk all the time. And it's like, I had, like, Hulk bowls and cups and stuff right. long before I had Hulk <laughs> comics you know like I was a six-year-old right. I, didn't, I didn't have any comic books but I knew Hulk just because he was right. on stuff that I would see every day did you yes, watch the TV very show? strange yeah yeah that's that's it you know it's like there's TV there's cartoons there are you know cups and things there's all this Hulk stuff before I get to like a Hulk comic book and right. it's like oh okay this this is great <laughs> I've been looking for this my whole life didn't realize it yeah, it's very strange how that, and I mean, it's got to be worse now, you know, with or greater now, whatever it is, like, people must see this stuff far more in every format, except right. comics, right. Um, you know, you almost have to seek that out now, if you want to track it down. The anime is is interesting in, like, that seems like a big influence in your art. You know, I, I think of things like, like Aeon Flux was big for me. Oh, and so me when too. I see your work, I see that, that, that yeah. like, super dynamic foreshortening, amazing figure work. But I see that in other anime too. So, you know, if you're an anime fan, you're, you can find examples of that there as well. Um, but no, Jim, I'm like, you know, I, I'm all, you know, like I, I give money to Peter on his uh, Patreon too. Like, I mean, almost is just like a, almost as a, like deference. Like, I feel like I owe him for who, you know, like who I've become. You know what I mean? Like, I think nothing was probably more formative to me in my youth than eon flux was you know what i mean like in terms of just everything about it like visually certainly but also the fact that like no answers are given like it's just you know this is this is something this is material for you to kind of like it's a whetstone for your imagination you know what i mean like it's not it's not like a plot that you need to know and whatever. It's like, no, these are ideas presented to you in a very interesting way. And then, you know, your imagination can run wild. It's closer to, he's, is what he gave us was closer to like, I think a toy than like a, I don't know, some sort of a narrative, right? <laughs> like it's something fun to kind of think about, you know, like each one is a little idea, the shorts, you know, in liquid television. Um, like a haiku or something. Yeah, you know, like a you just uh, left with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to. You met, You said something that was interesting about all of the. You know, you mentioned cups a couple times, which makes me think you must have a Hulk cup somewhere in your. In your Only <laughs> in my imagination. It's, oh, yeah. it's long gone physically, <laughs> right. but right. you know, it, I, I had it when I was six, and like I used to remember, like certain stuff registers different whenever you're six, seven, eight. You know, you don't have much experience. Like, like one year, Voltron was like my morning cartoon you know, before school, that was what was on every morning. And it's like branded in my head or something, right. because like for an entire year, that's what I watched every single day. There was a year where I, ate, you know, cereal and drank orange juice out of Hulk branded <laughs> cup and bowl, uh, you know, and it was at a formative time. So that's why it's so vivid in my head, just because like I'm six, what else is going on? You know, it's like, <laughs> you smashing that cereal. That's what it yes. was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So but to that point, um, when we started working on Grat Nin, so like that's my understanding of Grat Nin is sort of like a, a poppier version of something that I that I would do. I guess I'm always thinking about the pop. Um, I think when you say things, pop, do you yeah. is, is is that is that like a commercial? Is there a commercial implication whenever you say that? Uh, yes, I think inherent is a commercial uh, because for the you know what in our world, what could be popular without its sort of connection to um, the commercial, you know? Um, I think it's weird, man. Like one of the ways I start to realize my age is when I think about my relationship to uh, both pop art as like, as an actual critique or like trying to understand what, what it meant because it's like our parents, you know, or like the generations that came right before us, for them, it was new. So it's something they commented on, right? Like Coca-Cola being global was kind of like, 
it was kind of new. It, for them, it maybe was within their lifetime that that became a thing, right? Um, and for us, I feel like, you know, we were born into it, you know, maybe even a generation or two after <laughs> that was happening. Um, but I think it had already been sort of like digested into the into the um, the soil, the art soil, right? So when we were drawing out whatever we're drawing out, it's like, oh, by the time we were born, someone had already thought that the comics that we would see were interesting materially as like indicative of something culturally that was happening, right? Like so, our relationship to pop culture, I think is even informed by pop arts critique of, <laughs> or like, you know, you know, presentation of it, you know? Um, and I think for me, that's kind of, yeah, like when I think about, it's like, I can't even work on any of these things without kind of dragging some of that, you know, that energy, that vibe, that way of thinking either as, uh, sort of reproducing it or kind of reacting to it or rejecting it. I think it's like, it's inherent in uh, my my practice, you know? Um, so, and with Grattan in, uh, one of the things that I was interested in doing, so we have cards in there, right? Because like, one of the ways that I learned about X-Men, Dragon Ball, um, any number of other things was like the bubblegum packets or like little card sets, you know, like the X-Men was different. I feel like I got like little packages, but you can never get all of them. You know, there was always like that big complete set that that was behind glass. It's like, I'm a kid. I can never, you know, like no one who wanted that probably could afford it. And maybe adults at the time, but you know, like I, I just never would have thought adults would you like, who's going to buy 40 year old like, men living in their mother's <laughs> yeah, basements. You're right, right, right. But like for me, it would have been crazy. Right but you would get them piecemeal. And like, I was never a guy who, you know, okay, well back then we still had newsstands and like you go to 7-Eleven and get a comic, you know? So I would go in and get that comic and like, yo, you, you have, when do you have $5 or whatever to get like three or four comics back then, right? Hardly, you know, like, and then you gotta think between that and like a big bite or like a Slurpee or something, it's hot outside. It's like, okay, so I'll get this one comic. You read the comic, and then in the comic, it's like, um, uh, read this and issue whatever, read that. You know, like, so for me, um, the cards were really a part of the storytelling because, like, you would get it and it would say like famous battles, and it'd be like, oh, famous team ups, like Doom and Doctor Strange. Like, wow. So that became the storytelling became almost like decentralized, you know. So like, um. When I would see in the comic, it said like, read such and such for whatever issue, whatever. I have some shit like that in Grattan Inn. And I still have people say like, oh, well, when, where's those, where are those other issues? <laughs> so it's like, they're, I mean, they're, you know, imagine, you know, like imagine what it is. It became part of the language of the medium to me, right. you know, like, and the cards are part of the language too. Like, it's a way to experience the story. Like, it's not, you know, it's not like, at least to me, from my position, something that sort of comes from some centralized, you know, marketing plan for me, as experienced by me, it was just, yeah, part of the experience. Yeah, that makes total sense. You know, we, we often talk about like 90s, like we'll read Wizard Magazine or look at those early image books. The storytelling in those early image books are in the interviews, like they're in the right. promos that those guys are cutting. <laughs> and then like you read the comic and you think you know what's going on because you've read the interview and it explains right. everything. But if all you had was the comic, none of the stories in there. It's, it's incredible. Sometimes they'd be like in an editorial page in the back where, right. you know, the guy talks about creating this when he was a kid and stuff. But like the actual comics, there was no story. The story was everywhere else. <laughs> do you think about it like like in today's world, like do you see it as like social media as a place where you can mm. augment these stories? Uh, you know, you can add to them. You can you can give uh, little pieces or lead ins or I mean, it's the same deal as like the image stuff where it's like it's promo, you know, social media. If you're posting about, hey, I made this or check out this character, but it's also a story bit. Yeah, no, for sure. That's definitely how I think about it. Like, um. I'm kind of a little bit off my game now because I've had like a, I had like a careful uh, relationship with um, social media where it's like I dip in, 
I mostly just look at animals now. But like, <laughs> I I felt like I was producing for social media, which is like, so doing exactly what you're saying, but like, um, which is okay if it's fun for me, but like it, part of me felt a little bit angry, like I was producing value for like th these platforms and not getting paid for it, you know, like um, that value exists. It's not that it's magic that, you know, like, and it, it, this is kind of magical thinking, but it's like, I am producing value, right? But it's like, for whom, right? I know that's not 100% rational, but it happens to it happens to play out that way, right? So, um, but even back, I remember on Tumblr, I used to have like a Grattanin uh, Tumblr where I did a whole Grattanin comic on there, you know, like, um, yeah, like little, little posts that are ninja related that like, I honestly think it's a, it's like a patina, it's a collage, you know, like you're going down this, this uh, screen and you, you, oh, the, here's an article about Shirado Sampo, right? Like that's related to Grattan in now, like, but it's also related to that, you know, like, so, and you're pulling in all these different things, like, oh, here's a bit of technology where this person, I don't know, hacked, whatever, whatever. And it's like, okay, that's related to Grattan in. So like that becomes a part, a meta part of, uh, of the story. So absolutely man and like what's more and this is kind of interesting and maybe grotesque our our lives like even you know the the kayfabe right becomes a part of like how people relate to and connect to our work <laughs> you know what i mean like which is interesting it, it it's um i have a lot of complicated feelings about it <laughs> Yeah, you, you're you're getting into uh, some interesting waters there with the kayfabe. Like, I'm I'm kind of a believer the kayfabe is the majority of all of our lives and how we right. see each other, right. um, especially in an age of social media. You know, like it's all kayfabe. Everything that we right. post is is some version of that. Even if you're trying to be as transparent and you know direct as possible, it's still there's no way to know that because you're next to yeah. everybody else who's kayfabing their life there, yeah. you know, living their best life or their worst or whatever the case is. You know, putting this this persona out there it's it's a strange that part's such a strange like the mystery of life in a weird way i kind of love that part of it but it is definitely like i'm happy that i have an anchor or a reference point of like pre all of that right B because it, it, it i don't know i can't imagine it otherwise like if i were 13 or something and you know now you talk about showing your age here i go <laughs> but you know if you don't have that reference point like it's always just been that way where you're running like several of these different lives you know you're almost right. managing versions of yourself all over the place and that's uh i can't quite imagine that yeah i don't want to i'm not into management like i some of the projects that i've had to do yeah it's, it, I, I don't want to do so i've had to but um working on how not to but um i I don't want to do that for my life in a way that's kind of yeah giving space to i don't know is it you know is it is, is there a way to escape that in the world that we've built <laughs> like i don't know um i feel like i'm constantly trying to intervene and um free myself from that and like interacting with people online i have a very ambivalent relationship to it you know like i i think i don't know I'm, I'm hoping that the artwork and maybe even my own sort of um antagonistic relationship to it to the online thing becomes a, a way of um contextualizing it for myself and maybe others <laughs> you know like can it can it be better yes how can it be better you know um I mean, it's worked. So to, to get into this, like, it's it's given opportunities that probably. So for instance, like me working with Beehive, like, it liberated me in ways that you know um, I would have never uh, had before. You know, like, um, I I spent most of my career on the outside of the mainstream trying to get in. You know. Um, uh, that's a bit of a story, but I certainly knocked on the door a few times, <laughs> right? Um, I, I, you talked, uh, we talked, I think a little before, um, 
the interview about balance. Um, like, you know, I spent a lot of time doing work to help pay for my work in comics or me doing my, my stories, my, doing my art practice. Um, and like without, I don't know, Instagram or Tumblr before it, um, without Kickstarter really, or other types of uh, crowd funding, like there'd be no lab magazine. Like lab magazine is probably the closest to a pure expression of my work that I've actually had sort of from the beginning, you know, like produced in a way, you know, Prince of Cats is like, I had to work with editorial there. Not really. <laughs> Prince of Cats is pretty like no, but no, the, the adults were not paying attention <laughs> when I did Prince of Cats. Right. But there are limitations. Right. Um, hardly any. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I was never, you know, I'd never get a chance to do like, uh, Spider-Man or something like that. You know what I mean? So, but with lab, it's like, okay, people are, who are interested in my work, they give me the money to do something like <clears throat> unbound, you know, or bound in the ways that we've decided to bind, bind it. Right. Um, and I think that would have never existed without the current sort of technological, um, at the, the same technological reality that is alienating to me off, <laughs> you know? This so, is life though. You know, there's yeah. almost nothing that you can point at and say, that's all good or that's all bad. It just, you know, people, same, same thing, you know? And, and I kind of feel that way about what we're describing, talking about digital, social media, crowdfunding all of these things because you can find the evil side of crowdfunding too uh without without digging very deeply um but i'm glad you bring up lab and kickstarter uh you know i did a kickstarter two years ago for a black light comic and i came away with a very positive experience thinking like oh i can dream ideas now that i couldn't dream before because i couldn't necessarily sell them to somebody that was going to sign off or back them or, you know, do distribution, publishing, whatever. Like there were a lot of barriers that Kickstarter removed. And with lab, especially, I think I remember us talking about it probably in the early stages where like you were describing it and it was this oversized thing. And I can remember just being like internally shaking my head because I had done an oversized thing. Mm -hmm. And I heard from stores, I had a store email me begging me not to do that size. Like <laughs> it's outrageous in a way to think about, especially if you think of this stuff as art, mm -hmm. it is incredible to think of somebody doing that, being like, please don't do this size. Right. And I kind of thought that when you were describing lab, because yeah. it's just like, man, I've heard it from other yeah. cartoonists too that have done this, that have gone outside yeah. of the size limit. And that book looked like such a, that project looked like such a success from the outside, from my point mm -hmm. of view. And it's amazing, you know, like physically it, it feels like even 10 years ago, that would have been impossible to sell through the direct market. Right. And the crowdfunding has enabled it to be like, people want something that looks cool. Yeah. It's the sales piece that sort of gets in the way sometimes of that. Right. Stuff channels. You know what, Jim, like I wish uh, Josh was here to talk about distribution and all that. I'm going to say something that's like really responsible. And like, I respect you because it seems like you are, you have a game, your head is much more in the game. My head is in the game and other, other places, but not so much with lab and this as like, I really, I really don't care. It's like, once I make it like, uh, you know, once I have the bread to do it, it's like, I don't, the truth of the matter is I make my money doing other things. You know what I mean? Like, so lab is almost, if I ever get any money from it, it's like, oh, Oh, great. Like I got some money. It's like, I kind of done, I do other things so that I have a month and a half, two months to kind of like edit right. that between the work. And like, you know, the last couple issues I haven't done, like, um, no, the last issue, I didn't do a, uh, a whole new comic for it. You know, the next issue I'm looking to do a substantial amount of comic book work in it, but like, yeah, Comics has been really demoralizing for me in the sense that, you know, that format sense, like, <laughs> you know, I announced, oh my God, it'll get out, I don't give a fuck. It'll get out. <laughs> but like, I announced a couple books at Image, like, you know, years ago, right? Um, and, you know, I continued to work. I had an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and 
So after talking about constraints and like how constraints allow me to get to where I need to go, I'm going to say something that's a little bit um, counter to that, right? Which is, yeah, I, I kind of pitched around the ideas like, okay, let's do it as this, let's do that. <clears throat> and I came up against some of the same things that you've described, right? Like, okay, so if you do it like such, only such and such stores will do it. And like, this is gonna, the bottom line or whatever, whatever, whatever. It hit me so hard. <clears throat> I just, I don't know, like I just started doing something else. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I will. All right, well, I'll continue to think about this. I want to make these works, but um, if if these are the constraints, I'm just not excited about them. And like, I have a lot of other things begging for my attention. So I just kind of went in another direction. Like then lab came into view, then like, you know, the Prince of Cats thing, you know, like, you know, uh, all, all of that, like it got optioned. And then it's like, oh, well now I have a little bit of money to like, maybe just think about what I'm going to do. How am I gonna pursue my art practice? You know, like, does it have to be um, just the way that comics function? You're like the direct market, the relationship to the direct market, it's like, um, if, you know, it's a two-way street. It's like, ultimately, you see, I, it's crazy because it's like, there's so many stores. It's like, I love walking in there. I love seeing the people there, like some of the nicest people in the community. But at the same time, it's like, how much of it is there? Is it there for me? You know what I mean? Like, maybe there are those only those 30 stores that are like the types of stores that like I would be a part of and be in and, and you know, enjoy what they have. They have art books. They have zines. They have oversized format. Like, those are the stores that I'm going to go to, right? So like, and if that's not enough to support my art practice, then like, I need to start to think about how I can relate to those 30 stores and maybe other places and other ways of reaching out to people who are interested in what I'm doing instead of being like, okay, I'm gonna let this whole other market that I'm just like in the ghetto of dictate the actual form of what I'm doing. <laughs> like that's crazy. Yeah. It is. I uh I, I think about this a lot as you can imagine. You know, I'm kind of in a similar if, if you're making your own stuff, like you, you know, you got to make these choices, right? If you're not working with an editor or have a publishing deal, like you're the guy setting the format and, and figuring this stuff out. So I, I do think about this stuff a lot. And occasionally I think like I hate to complain about any of this stuff because I think we live in something of a golden age of a lot of stuff. Like if you really wanted to do something, anything, make a movie, make an animated video, make a graphic novel, like there are so many ways to do it now, like you can do it. But the flip side is like, if you can do anything, it, it can sometimes be hard to do something. Right. Because <laughs> I have the same deal of like, you know, there's a lot of projects in various stages of development. It takes me a long time between projects because you are pulled in all these different directions, you know, and as an artist, yeah. like you're interested in a bunch of stuff. Do you, do you find that, that it's just like, man, life is short and mm. got a lot of ideas. Yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> that part, you know I mean? Like that is, that is what it is. And so what I've started to think about is um, I started to think about like, well, what does it mean to man, Peter, for sure. Like looking at Peter's career is like, Oh my God, bro. Like you did everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to do anything else. Like, you've already done, you've done like several lifetimes worth of work, you know? But um, I've stopped, I stopped looking at it. I stopped looking at it as, okay, well, um, yeah, I have a, a lifetime or several lifetimes of things that I want to do. Sometime in like my mid 20s, I was like, I, you know, I looked at my sketchbook, I looked at like the stories that I had, and I'm like, oh, I have more than a life's worth of work. That I could do here <laughs> you know what I mean so like at that point and like the clock never stops ticking I started to be like well what are the different ways that I can continue to express myself in a way that is like pleasurable while at the same time like eating and living and like um enjoying the life the non-imaginary life <laughs> right that I have here in front of me um and what that means is uh being open to how um I can find, you know, like pleasure in my day to day, as well as like, um, so with Sunset Park, which I announced for Image, like, 
well, what is the practice of making Sunset Park? You know, like um, the practice is, first of all, years of shit that no one ever sees, right? And the value of doing that work is really just for me. It's me exploring like all of these ideas and finding meaning in those ideas, right? And then maybe you get something, <laughs> the world gets something from that, right? Um, the, the, the value of it isn't in the thing that I make, to be honest. Like I, I hate to, maybe people don't want to hear that. Like, um, I think people can find value in what I produce. Right. And I can too. Right. But the crazy thing is like, by the time something is in your hands, right. Like the, say the reader, um, Mm -hmm. or the audience, um, I'm done with it. (laughs) Like the best, the only value that's coming to me after that is probably, um, my relationship to the uh, the audience, like maybe they see something or they understand it in a way that I was unable to because of my particular standpoint. Um, or like maybe it gives me some bread so that I can continue to explore these things. And that's our relationship, right? Um, and I think uh, what my um, sort of motive now is to feed that, you know what I mean? Like, and by grace, you know, like I have people who um, support me in the ways that they, that they have to help to give me space to do that. Um, the vast majority of it <clears throat> I get from, you know, what I, what I told another friend of mine, Ben uh, <clears throat> Passmore is piracy. It's like, um, it becomes a game like capital will always offer you less than what your work is worth right so the game for me is to get as much or more value from my labor than what it's worth right? like it's a game that we're playing right and if i can get that value which in some cases is maybe you know like if i really win it's theft right it's theft from my employer right <laughs> But like, if I can get like a lot of money from a client, then it's like, it frees me up to do whatever I want to do at whatever pace I want to do it. You know what I mean? Um, And it's like, and it also frees me up to give more to like, say, you know, like with lab, I think, I don't know, I, at least for my part, I put more into lab than I get out of it, right? But like, I probably wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't do like one or two corporate jobs a year where, I mean, I I hope none of them will listen to this, but like, I'm doing my best to like, you know, get as much from that as possible. Like, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I, I, uh, I go back to the very first comic I ever had published, like, like Street Angel number one. I remember from the oh, time- Oh, was that I your mean- first comic published? Yeah, I did mini comics and stuff, you know, before that, but like the first one was that, that I had a publisher actually like print and distribute and everything. That was it. Have I, wait, 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 slow down, slow down. Have I read that one? Probably. Was that collected? It was collected? Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. uh, it's uh, Dr. Pangea. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember like going to the comic book store that I had been going to for years and I was, you know, I told them this book's coming out. I was so excited and I get there and it's on the shelf. And nobody's paying attention. And I kind of look at, I, I've seen it already, you know, SLG had sent me my copies. Right. So I'm standing in the oh, comic book store, graphics, huh? <laughs> looking at it going, well, there you go. You know, I had finished it six months before then because they needed two issues done first. I was right. working on issue three or four at that point, barely remember even drawing this. And it was this super anticlimactic moment. And I realized like, you know, the, the, the reward is the days at the drawing table. And that's right. what I'm gesturing. My drawing table is like, right. over here. <laughs> okay. but, but those right. are the rewards. And you got to figure that part out. Like you talk about making the work pleasurable. It's like, that's where, you know, you spend your 300 days a year at the drawing table. The, right. the release date is like one day, you know, right. one, one, one day infrequently, maybe every couple of years. And it's the drawing table that you control, you know, like, Like once the book's published, it it really isn't mine anymore. It's whoever buys it or reads it or, you know, pirates it or whatever, however they get it, it's no longer (laughs) mine. Uh, You know, like I'm done with it. You know, I, I, I mean, I have some relationship to it, but I'm, it's out of my hands. It's out of my head. Um, So I think that's common. You know, you, you, you sound a little bit like maybe that's revealing something, but I feel like that's pretty common with creators, you know, cause you're, we always are sort of, I don't want to say chasing that next idea, but I mean, our heads 
you know, you hear about like Jack Kirby or Charles Schultz couldn't even drive because they're just constantly, right. you know, having ideas spinning around in their heads. So I think that's pretty common. Um, but you know, the, the point of like the returns that you get from it though, they come in lots of different ways. It's not always just the financial part, right? You know, it can be the thing of like, this is what I've been trying to say for 20 years. And I finally feel like mm. this story does it, or this drawing is what I've been, you know, trying to make work. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of ways to measure that too. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of cartoonists, a lot of comic book makers do that, what you describe. It's like the corporate gig buys me X amount of time. It really right. is like, I, I hate to say it, but it's time is money, you know? And yeah. it's like, you, you spend some of that time in a way that maximizes that money. And then you get that, that cushion, that, that window, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. I, as I've gotten, you know, every once in a while, you may get a gig where you find you can you know, maybe practice your your art while also getting that inordinate amount of money, which is like, I've been, I'm on a job now where it's like, it's been fun. Like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm learning things and like, I'm asking myself questions with the work, you know, like I'm getting to explore different things and, you know, express, not, you know, like, yeah, express myself or maybe, um, I think, <laughs> man, like you play it down, but um we talked a bit before and I was like oh I think our works are in dialogue with each other somewhat like um I I actually rarely for someone who works in comics I feel like I go back to the same comics over and over and over again like I I look at a bunch of comics but I don't particularly look for or even read a bunch of comics you know um but I do think over the years uh, of contemporary cartoonists who, particularly ones that I know, like your work has jumped out to me on more than one occasion. Um, and I think like something like Super Mag seemed like, okay, well, this is kind of, I've always been chasing sort of like, how do you do something like, um, like Nan or like uh, Matal Harlan, like it, maybe even not like Matal Harlan, but something between Matal Harlan and Nan, you know, like something uh, that has all that, because it, there's nothing like picking that sort of thing up. I feel like when I picked up Super Mag, I was like, okay, this guy is like obviously um, trying to do something similar to what, I, what I'm trying to do, right? Or thinking about it, you know, like definitely approaching the comics magazine as its own type of aesthetic. You know, like um, if it were, you know, like, so instead of, like as if X-Men were comics magazine, right? Like I'm going to do a comics magazine, you know, like with all of these different elements, you know, like, and I think, you know, you see some of that same type of thinking uh, with, I don't know, like building stories, you know, like some someone thinking like, okay, well, I'm trying to create this, um, recreate something, an experience retroactively that comes from a different material world than the one that we even live in, <laughs> you know, like putting these different parts as part of an aesthetic, not as part as like of a, you know, even functional all the time, but like it's part of an aesthetic that you experience with some. I, I'm sure you've talked about Super Mag in many uh, a podcast. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> well, man, that's you. flattering. You know, I'm a fan of your work. So so hearing that is 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 uh, is very nice. Thank you. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. And I could point at things that, that that comes from, you know, like when you're describing non and some of this stuff, first thing that pops in my head is rubber blankets, you know, David Mazzucchelli's magazine where he was publishing a few other cartoonists and he was working through style stuff and production was a big piece, you know, like there's yeah. certainly precedent for all this, even, even something like raw magazine, you know, like, like that yes. was something I barely yes. got hold of, but I did. And it was like, what is this? This is like a different language, even though I think it's comics. Right. And it was the same deal where it's like production and a lot of different perspectives on those pages and it just it just once you see that it's like you can't unsee it yeah francoise i've been trying to get her in lab magazine for like you know two three years francoise if you hear this um just say yes already you're like <laughs> <laughs> i always I always answer her emails like i'm always you know <clears throat> give me a, give me an interview i think i think it's important i i think i feel like super mag um lab I, i'm hoping um these types of publications are also sort of 
they are they're bringing a bit of technology every time they come out you know what i mean like and they're giving it to people who may pick it up you know like our works are super disposable um often may, even if they survive they they become so expensive that people can't you know uh easily find them or get them so <clears throat> i think it's like our jobs to continue to bring that imagination excitement and freedom you know to generations to come and like even in a way like i remember in paul's uh giant size thb he did an article on um on um hugo pratt <clears throat> that might have been where i i learned about hugo pratt you know um and i think it's just like a responsibility and I, you know um i think we're just doing uh a service for ourselves and for the future to continue to kind of like give a little bit of space for cartooning to happen in a way that you know we experienced and even giving it space to be something else that we haven't <clears throat> experienced you know like for the future um i think it's super important for the art especially when you know the vast like the at least in the west the biggest platforms are not particularly uh conducive to cartoonists like it's dope that you're on hulk you know what i mean like um are you like how many other you know like at any given time what are there like two or three cartoonists working on like a big book like that you know like it's it's very rare you know like um so i think and it's good that you're given that platform because i i feel like what type of people will come up to comics maybe do kids even read those anymore but like if a kid picks that up you know like they'll pick it up and they'll be like, oh, this, this has got a different vibe. Like this has got a vibe, you know, like I like this, you know, like this is what comics is for me, you know, like. I hope you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of agree with you about the, uh, I don't know if kids are still reading any of that or not, right. but uh, they're certainly reading some comics, you know, I mean, the all ages stuff is something that has really right. come back in the last 10 years and was not there whenever I was reading in the nineties and right. the early two thousands. Um, Man, I hope you get Francois. And, and whenever you finish your interview with her, tell her that cartoonist Kayfabe would love to speak to her. <laughs> but I'll write it down right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ron, man, we are we are kind of at, at, at our time and uh, it flew by. Uh -huh. um, I want to point everybody at Grattan Inn uh, once again before before we wrap this up. It should be a live Kickstarter right now. So anybody that's been intrigued by this conversation, please go check that out. Um, one of the one of the comics that I'm most looking forward to. And I think uh, whether you're a format junkie or just a fan of comics and action comics, um, this thing's going to be spectacular. So no, probably up for about a month or so, uh, but you can find that on Kickstarter. Where else should people, uh, what, what else should they look for, Ron? Where should they follow you? Um, Want to plug your Patreon? I mean, yeah, they can check me out on Instagram. Like I put some free stuff on Instagram. Like I'm, I'm okay with my Patreon. Like, I, you know, now that I, um, now that I follow Peter, I'm just like, do you have to just, do you have to like set a new bar and everything that you do? It's like his <laughs> Patreon is like the best Patreon ever, right? So um, yeah, you can follow me on Patreon. Like after uh, after getting off of this kayfabe, I'm going to go, I think I'm going to put up the some of the Gratin in inks that I have up there. I think they would like that, you know? Um, yeah, it's just me complaining about things mostly or like putting up obscure uh, whatever media that I, that I feel like talking about, you know? So yeah, follow me on Patreon if you want. You know, like, but only if you really care. Because, <laughs> like, I'm not, yeah, like, keep it 100. Like, I'm, you know, that's for, like, the only the the true, you know, like, I don't even want to say fans. Like, people in the community, it's like, I'm out here, you know, I appreciate them <laughs> a lot. Uh, and, yeah, Instagram, you can check me out there. Like, I think I will be putting news around, like, um, Grattan Inn, uh, Lab, um, any of the stuff, uh, other stuff that I'm doing, like, um, I'll probably I'll be announcing like an, at least one animated project, probably two animated projects later this year. So look for me there. You know what I mean? Man, we have a lot more to uh, talk about. You know, we, we we've been talking to people that have these big careers, and it's kind of like we just scratched the surface. But uh, yeah, hopefully, I mean, uh, we'll connect again soon and uh, dive into more of your work. Yeah, once and once I um yeah once I announce some of the animation stuff. We can get Ed on here and we can talk about uh <laughs> we can talk about working with Hollywood. I know he'll he'll have something to say about that. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best material to put out, out publicly or not. But... <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks, Ron. It's great to see you, man. Yo, Good luck with yeah, Grad Thank you.
It was nice talking.